In Montpelier, Vermont lawmakers return to the Capitol for a much-anticipated veto session this week. The House and Senate have overwhelming Democratic majorities, and their leaders came ready to override the Republican governor's vetoes. First up, a massive child care overhaul to expand access to many, many more Vermont kids and lower costs for parents. Backers say that will make it easier for parents to be able to work, something many employers would welcome. Governor Phil Scott objected, though, to the new tax needed to fund the child care expansion, but the bill was easily overridden. On Wednesday, advocates celebrated the victory on the State House lawn. It means programs like ours can offer more spots to more families. It means financial relief for families to attend our school. It also means stability as we can pay our teachers closer to a living wage and retain our talented early childhood educators. NBC 5 Stephen Biddix now joins us for a recap. And Stephen, the House and Senate leaders seem to have come prepared, uh, knowing exactly what votes they had to get what through. Yes, Stu. Governor Phil Scott vetoed seven bills since adjournment, and by the end of the first day of this week's veto session, the House and Senate had overridden five of them and sent the other two back for further review. Well, uh, that was a surprise, at least, that things moved that quickly. They budgeted, I think, three days for this thing. Yes, Stu, we were fully expecting to be there for definitely two, maybe even three days. And when getting there on Tuesday, lawmakers had the thought that they were going to stay late on Tuesday to maybe finish early on Wednesday. But as we started to get later into the afternoon, it became very feasible that we could be done with everything in one day. And inevitably, that's what happened. And lawmakers were out of the state house by 6 o'clock on Tuesday evening. Let's talk about the big bill, the must-pass bill, the $8 billion state budget. Um, Scott vetoed it because it essentially meant a 13 percent uh, spending increase and new taxes and fees, for example, for anyone who drives a car or a truck. You'll notice that the next time you uh, renew your license at the DMV. Yes, Stu. In the House, where the GOP has roughly 40 of the 150 seats, the writing was on the wall. Republicans were somewhat vocal on the floor. Minority Leader Patricia McCoy spoke, but there really wasn't a ton because they knew at the end of the day they just weren't going to have the votes to uphold a majority override. And here's some of the sound from the floor on Tuesday. Our collective work matters. It affects the lives of every Vermonter. This budget makes historic investments within housing, child care, Medicaid rates, transportation, education, workforce, and more. We must take a broader approach, a broader look at our financial picture. I cannot support this rate of spending and new taxes and fees. My constituents cannot afford the decisions we have made this session. My constituents cannot afford this budget. We are breaking the backs of Vermonters. Well, in the end, the budget passed easily, 105 to 42 in the House, 25 to 5 in the Senate, so mostly along party lines. But, Stephen, you know, lawmakers had gotten an earful that that budget they had passed back in May did not do enough to sort of soften the transition for a couple of thousand homeless Vermonters who are now leaving uh, motel rooms funded by the federal government throughout the pandemic. Uh, so what is the fix there? Yes, Stu. So the Senate and House leadership came together with Governor Scott to pass a companion bill that would go along with the budget. So what this is going to do is they're finding new money that's already existing within the budget to help those that are most vulnerable and the ones that were going to be exited on July 1st. So now those that were supposed to be exited come July will have an extension until April of 2024, but it comes with a few stipulations. Those residents must now pay 30 percent of their gross income to stay in their rooms and they also have to prove that they're actively looking for permanent housing. And those residents will also be working with the Agency of Human Services hand in hand to try to figure out where they're going to go next, because at the end of the day, permanent housing is the main fix to the situation. So that was a concession to that group of 17 progressives and Democrats who had withheld their support from the budget the first time around. Um, tell us what else happened uh, during Tuesday's sort of whir uh, whirlwind override session. Yes, Stu. So a bill that would have raised fees for some professional licenses was overridden. There was also a Brattleboro charter change that was overridden that will now allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in municipal elections. Governor Scott has vetoed that in the past, but was overridden this time around. There was also a Burlington charter change that allows non-citizens the right to vote in municipal elections. 
overriding Scott, who objected he wanted a statewide policy and he doesn't want town by town patchwork. So Burlington now joins Winooski and Montpelier as the third municipality allowing non-citizens to participate in local elections going forward. Now here's how Senator Phil Baruth summed up the veto session. We overrode five of the governor's veto in one day, never even been close to done before, but those five aren't all. We also passed and overrode S5 during the normal session. So six vetoes in one session. That historic number of overrides is tied directly to the governor's historic number of vetoes. So we would prefer not to be overriding. We hope that this will be a sort of gentle reminder to him that people want these policies and hopefully he'll let them become law next time. So Democrats feeling their oats, uh, but uh, two bills uh, were not overridden this week, including the big increase in legislative pay, the one that would almost double statehouse salaries and benefits, adding health coverage for the first time over the next couple of years. What happened? Yes, Stu, so it seemed like they had the numbers in the House to override this veto, but that just wasn't the case in the Senate. After I spoke with Senate President Phil Baruth after the day was over, he said they only were going to get 18, maybe 19 senators on board, and that just wasn't enough to hit that two-thirds majority override number. And, yeah, and finally, that juvenile justice bill sent back to committee, what happened? Yeah, so age was really the big thing on that. Governor Scott not in support because it restricts what interrogative policies police can use up to those that are 22 years old. He felt that number should be down at 18. Some legislators also felt the same, so they'll recircle around back on that in January. Tough day uh, for the governor. NBC5 Stephen Biddix, thank you. And we'll be right back.